Today we will learn and reflect on the legacy of Hans Kung and his influential writings that deeply influenced Catholic theology during and after the Second Vatican Council. You may ask, how can we benefit when we ponder the legacy of Hans Kung? Several decades ago, Hans Kung irritated Pope John Paul II in the Curia and was banned from teaching Catholic doctrine. So we must ponder the question. Can good Catholics read the works of Hans Kung? Should good Catholics read the works of Hans Kung? At the end of our talk, we will discuss how many of Hans Kung's works influenced Catholicism, what works helped get him banned, and my blog that also covers this topic, and we will include many web links we discussed in this video. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. Hans Kung recently passed away in April 2021. Although his license to teach at a Catholic university was revoked, he was not excommunicated, and he was not defrocked. He was a priest in good standing, able to celebrate Mass until the day he died. His university created an ecumenical theology department so he could continue to teach in spite of the Vatican decree, and the Vatican did not object. Upon the news of his death, the Vatican's Pontifical Academy for Life tweeted out the following, One of the truly great figures in the theology of the last century is gone, whose ideas and analysis should always make the church, the church's society, and the culture think. If you followed the news last year, it appeared that Pope Francis was floating a plan to reconcile with Hans Kung, and he quite likely discussed this with the Pope Emeritus Benedict, but the howling objections were way too loud and nothing became of it. Explaining the thumbnail, Hans Kung was one of the leading theologians participating in the Second Vatican Council and was greatly influential in drafting many of its decrees. In some ways, he reminds me of Luther. He was incredibly brilliant. Not only could he write for the academics and the theologians, but he could also write clearly so the layman could understand his often very thick books. And Hans Kung made quite a bit of money publishing best-selling books on Catholicism. He used his money to buy a bright fire engine red Alfa Romeo, and he used to race around Rome in his red Alfa Romeo, and his opponents pointed to this race car as representing the hubris and arrogance of Hans Kung. As you can see from behind in my book stand, I've purchased many, but not all of the books Hans Kung has published over many decades. My first taste of Catholicism came from reading Hans Kung, and the breadth of many of his books is simply remarkable. Now this here is a housekeeping video. There are a few books he wrote that I need to consult when I discuss Vatican II because they were so influential that they are now part of the history of the Second Vatican Council. So I need to establish that reading these books by Hans Kung is really okay, especially since Vatican II, the Catholic Church, does not print a list of books Catholics are forbidden to read. Like Martin Luther, Hans Kung possesses a great deal of self-confidence, bordering on hubris. And Hans Kung was always eager to lecture the Catholic Church on all the reforms it must enact immediately. And Hans Kung can give you many lists of necessary reforms. Several decades ago, I read a news article that quoted Cardinal Schonborn, and he's the doctoral student of Pope Benedict. And the Cardinal was saying that although Hans Kung was quite beloved in the Vatican, they really wished he would quit constantly calling press conferences where he criticized the Catholic Church for ignoring all his urgent suggestions for reform. Although there is sympathy, although not total agreement, with his liberal views on topics like priestly celibacy, the sexual scandals, and papal infallibility, his constantly clamoring questions of the uh, church teachings on these topics was not helpful, especially after he kept rocking the boat after being repeatedly warned that he was not being helpful. After all, Hans Kung was never the sole source of truth, and some of the more provocative titles of some of his books were not helpful either. Hans Kung was a friend to many in the inner circles of the church, since he was one of the leading theologians of the Second Vatican Council. 
Indeed, he gave a friendly reference to the young priest Ratzinger, who later became Pope Benedict, when he was accepted as a professor at the University of uh, Tübingen in Germany. Hans Kung was always more flamboyant uh, than uh, Benedict, driving around campus in his fire engine red Alfa Romeo sports car. While teaching in Tübingen, they had a dinner each Thursday to discuss theology, and they were both editors of a scholarly theology journal. Sources claim that Rattinger came more conservative politically in response to the student protests in the 60s, although both Kung and Ratzinger always supported the theological pronouncements of Vatican II. Although his license to teach Catholic theology was revoked in 1979, Pope Benedict publicly agreed to spend one fall afternoon in 2005 with his old university friend, Hans Kung. Oh, that I could be a fly on the wall to listen to their discussions. Their meeting was cordial as they reminisced about their friendship and their youth, and they agreed to disagree. Was Hans Kung's teaching restriction discussed? Only God and the fly on the wall knows, and Pope Emeritus Benedict, of course. The article reporting this meeting between Pope Benedict and Hans Kung said, In terms of substance, Kung said the two men found agreement on matters of social justice, the relationship between faith and reason, between science and religion, and the need for Christianity to collaborate with other world religions in building what Kung has termed a global ethic. This article quotes a fellow theologian saying this about Hans Kung. Sometimes Kung conducts himself like a second magisterium. To tell you the truth, one is enough, at least for me. And our blog that we refer to has the link for this and all the other articles we're discussing. Hans Kung, the troublemaker, says this in an article submitted to the National Catholic Reporter. In 2016, my appeal to Pope Francis to give room to a free, unprejudiced, and open-ended discussion on the problem of infallibility appeared in the leading journals of several countries. I was thus overjoyed to receive a personal reply from Pope Francis immediately after Easter. And you can read Kung's summary of the response of Pope Francis in the article. And the main takeaway is that Catholics can safely read the writings of Hans Kung and that the Catholic Church has no interest in banning his books. In this article in 2010, Hans Kung points a finger at Pope Benedict regarding the continuing uh, child sex scandal in the Catholic Church and other topics. And the article includes the text of his open letter to the bishops of the Catholic Church. The most important published document is the 1979 declaration revoking the license for Hans Kung to teach Catholic theology by Pope John Paul II. And this was seconded by Cardinal Ratzinger, showing the irritation that Hans Kung repeatedly admonished the faithful as if he himself were the second magisterium. And this is what the declaration from the Vatican says regarding his insistent and repeated warnings rejecting papal infallibility. Pope John Paul II says, Hans Kung in no way has sought to conform to the doctrine of the magisterium. Instead, he has recently proposed his view again more explicitly even though the Sacred Congregation has affirmed that such an opinion contradicts the doctrine by Vatican I and Vatican II. Therefore, the Sacred Congregation uh, has declared that Hans Kung can no longer be considered a Catholic theologian, nor function as such in a teaching role. Now, there were many in the Vatican who were sympathetic to the views expressed by Hans Kung, particularly Cardinal Ratzinger, later to become Pope Benedict, but they respected the authority of the Church, and refrained from constantly holding press conferences demanding that the church immediately reform itself. And with the help of Dr. Google, we reviewed the perspectives of other Catholic leaders regarding Hans Kung. And in the 2013 issue of the America magazine, the National Jesuit magazine, uh, they reprint their original editorial from 1963, where they state, We don't entirely agree with Father Kung, but we would not think of charging him with talking foolishness. Every single item he brought up has already been recommended by a cardinal or bishop for the agenda of the Second Vatican Council. Maybe he was impudent to talk so much. Well, like the quotation he took from Pope John's encyclical, we must never confuse error in the person who errs. Now, Hans Kung was quite fond of writing open letters to scold and irritate his friends in the Catholic hierarchy. So the famed Catholic author George Weigel who did the biography of John Paul II, he penned this humorous open letter to Hans Kung. 
decade and a half ago, a former colleague of yours among the younger progressive theologians of Vatican II told me of a friendly warning he had given you at the beginning of the Council's second session. As this distinguished biblical scholar remembered these heady days, you had taken to driving around Rome in a fire engine red convertible. This automotive display struck your colleague as imprudent and necessarily self-advertising. Given that some of your more adventurous opinions and your talent for what would later be called the soundbite were already raising eyebrows and hackles in the curia. So, as the story was told me, your friend called you aside one day and using a French term you both understood. Hans, you are becoming too evident. And George Weigel goes on for a few more paragraphs discussing his foolish hubris and some uncomplimentary comments on his lunch with Pope Benedict. And my blog also quotes a scathing 2x4 beatdown by the conservative EWTN magazine. Much can be learned, though, from reading the works of Hans Kung, and good Catholics should be reassured that reading Kung in the proper manner can be spiritually beneficial. However, the example of Hans Kung should remind us that no matter how much we know, we do not know everything. No matter how brilliant we are, we cannot understand everything. And no matter how many degrees hang on our wall, we can and must learn from our brothers in Christ, no matter how humble they are. We should never permit our hubris to override our humility as we seek to understand and discuss the teachings of the Church. We wish to end on a positive note, so we're going to quote this Catholic reflection that I've not seen elsewhere in the beginning of one of Hans Kung's books. Duty without love breeds weariness. Duty with love breeds constancy. Responsibility without love breeds unconcern. Responsibility with love breeds concern. Righteousness without love breeds hardness. Righteousness with love breeds reliability. Education without love breeds contrariness. But education with love breeds patience. Wisdom without love breeds rifts. Wisdom with love breeds understanding. Friendliness without love breeds hypocrisy. Friendliness with love breeds grace. Order without love breeds pettiness. Order with love breeds generosity. Knowledge without love breeds dogmatism. But knowledge with love breeds trustworthiness. Power without love breeds violence. But power with love breeds readiness to help. Honor without love breeds arrogance. But honor with love breeds modesty. Possessions without love breeds avarice. Possessions with love breeds generosity. Faith without love breeds fanaticism. But faith with love breeds peacemaking. And so the main sources that I used are the links I quoted from my blog. And as you can see personally over many decades, I've purchased more books penned by Hans Kung than by any other modern author. And I say modern because St. Augustine himself also wrote an equally impressive number of books and sermons over his lifetime. Some of these books were so immensely influential that they influenced the history of Vatican II Church. For example, Hans Kung's books, The Council Reform and Reunion, was published in the last years of Vatican II and influenced the closing sessions of the Council. This book also gave a great assist in the gossiping at the coffee stations of the Council. Many were jealous, as it seemed the profits from the book enabled Hans Kung to buy his fire engine red Alfa Romeo sports car. Hans Kung's doctoral thesis, which was later published as his work, Justification, argued that the doctrine of justification, as expressed in the work of the leading Protestant theologian of the day, the commentary of the Epistle to Romans by Karl Barth, and some of his other works, was far more similar to the decree on justification issued by the Council of Trent, which Vatican II did not alter at all. All of these works on justification can be a challenge to read and understand, but Hans Kung actually asked Karl Barth to write an introduction to his book in which he testified that, indeed, Hans Kung properly understood Barth's stated views on justification. Vatican II led to a dialogue with the Lutheran Church, and after meeting and discussing the issues for 30 years, the Roman Pontifical Council and the Lutheran World Federation issued a joint declaration on the doctrine of justification in 1998, which is prominently mentioned in Denzinger, the, the Catholic compilation of decrees. These decrees are all available on the Vatican website, both in English and in Latin and Greek, so Denzinger is indeed an optional uh, purchase, and it's a bit pricey. And Denzinger says this, The Lutheran churches and the Catholic churches have together listened to the good news proclaimed in the Holy Scriptures. This common listening, and along with the theological conversations, have led to a shared understanding of justification. 
This encompasses a consensus in the basic truths. And our blog on the Council of Trent discusses justification in greater depth than our YouTube video on Trent. But in late 2021, we plan to issue a series of blogs and videos on the related topics original sin, free will, and justification from the writings of Luther, Erasmus, Trent, Barth, and this Lutheran Catholic Joint Declaration. The book on infallibility and inquiry on whether the Pope is infallible is the book that really got Hans Kung into so much hot water with the Curia. These other books are not all of Hans Kung's literary output, but these are books I purchased and mostly read, although some I read many decades previously. Although he wrote My Struggle for Freedom, his autobiography in the 2000s, after his Catholic teaching permission was pulled, it ends with the Second Vatican Council, so he doesn't get into the ugly history afterwards. His book, Christianity, seems to me to be a summary of all his tomes on Christianity and Catholicism released up to that point. His excellent book on the great Christian thinkers covers the life and works of Paul, Origen, Augustine, Aquinas, Luther, Schleiermacher, and Barth. And another excellent book goes into incredible detail about the other main religions of the world. Hans Kung's On Being a Christian, The Church, and Does God Exist are books with impressive range. His slimmer but more focused books on Freud and his problem with God and Credo on the Apostles' Creed are both excellent books that I highly recommend. You just can't ignore the writings of Hans Kung. They were tremendously influential for the Vatican II Catholic Church. And despite the revoking of his Catholic teaching certificate, I pray that I've been successful in demonstrating the good Catholic can indeed read the works of Hans Kung with discernment as always. Please click on the link for our blog and the books we reviewed if you wish in the description below. And please subscribe to our channel, consider being a patron, and please click on the links for other interesting videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul. Thank you.